Today's sermon text is from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Jesus, or Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you will not always have me. When the large crowd of of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Our worship leaders are so thoughtful to pick out music that just fits really well, that we want to cast our treasures before him in order to know him deeper. That's what we're looking at in this text today. So bow your heads with me in prayer and let's think about the things that we need to let go of and surrender to King Jesus that we may know him more today. God, I know we come... We all come in here with all kinds of baggage, some good things that are distracting us, some bad things that seem to have a grip on us. I pray right now in this moment with our heads bowed, the sovereign king of the universe standing over us and his throne from heaven, speaking to us through his word with his spirit present among us that you would release us from all those things that hold our hearts. Help us surrender them to King Jesus. Help us respond to his glory, his beauty put on display before us by honoring him with all that we have with our entire lives. God, would you use this preaching? Would you use our time of worship and fellowship, our prayer, our songs, all of it together, to cling to Jesus more tightly and let go of all those other things. Make yourself known to us now through this word. Amen. The amount you value something will determine what you give to it. The amount you value something will determine what you give to it. A few years ago, Laura Young... An antique dealer was shopping at Goodwill in Austin, Texas, when she noticed under the table, amidst a bunch of other junk, a a little statue, a head, with a yellow sticker on it, valuing it at $34.99. Having a little bit of knowledge of historical objects, she kind of did a double take, wondering if what she was looking at was really a worthless piece of junk that was at a discount thrift store, or if it was something far greater. As she examined the bust, she realized that it was solid marble, and it looked strikingly similar to all those ancient Roman statues, busts of, of famous generals, military generals, and Caesars. So she gladly paid $35 for it, brought it home and began her research to find out what it was. And after some online study and connecting with the London auction house, she confirmed that indeed it was the bust 
of the popular Roman general named Drusus Germanicus, and it was probably over 2,000 years old. The last place this statue was known, this sculpture was known to be on display, was in a German museum that was built in 1840. So sometime between then and now, it got out of that museum, probably during World War II, some American soldier claimed it for himself, shoved it in his rucksack and took it home. And he put it on his shelf at home as a little trophy of his military victory. And somehow traveled all the way through his life, through a couple of generations, to the floor beneath a table at a Goodwill in Austin, Texas. How does a priceless piece of historical art end up there for $35? Somebody valued it at some point and put it in a museum for all to see. And then somehow it ends up in this other guy's hands. He takes it home, puts it on his mantle, and then his kids inherit it after he dies, thinking, why did dad have this thing? And they put it in the attic with all his other weird collectibles, and then they die, and the grandkids go in the attic to clean it all out, and they're like, what is all this stuff? We'll just take it to Goodwill, along with a box of knickknacks and some china from their china cabinet and a few old pieces of clothes. And there it sits. To them, it had no value, not as a piece of art or a family heirloom. So they dumped a valuable treasure that was right in front of them into a collection of junk. They couldn't see its value. But one woman did, and she was willing to give up $35 and much more for it as she spent time to purchase it, research its significance, travel around the world so she could get it back to its rightful place in front of the world's eyes to see its great value. Likewise, in our text today, we see similar treatment of something that's of far more value. Not something, but someone. Some people recognized his value and responded appropriately according to the value they saw in him. Others couldn't see anything worth of value. They saw a dusty piece of trash and they responded according to the lack of value they saw in him, ready to throw him out at the first opportunity they had. So John writes this section for us to ask what you see in Jesus. Will you see the priceless treasure that he is and respond appropriately? When you see Christ as the fulfillment of God's promises, you must honor Christ as your only source of life. That's the idea we're going to look at in this text by examining the different ways that the people here saw the value of Jesus or by comparison, missed his value and how each responded. So first, we'll briefly look at Martha and Lazarus in verse 2, modeling service to Christ, rest in his provision and protection as your king. And then in verses 3 through 8, we see Mary and Judas provide a contrast in valuing Jesus as a sacrifice. And finally, in verses 9 through 11, the crowds and the priests push us to honor Christ as your resurrection, the source of your life. In each of these examples, these people don't really know the full extent of what they're doing. John is speaking years after, looking in and recognizing, my goodness, how we missed it. But he tells the story to compel us to honor Christ as your only source of life. So let's return to the text in verses 1 and 2, where we set the scene by first preparing to honor Christ as your king. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a dinner, gave a dinner for him there. Martha served And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. 
John is really careful in the words he chooses to tell these stories. He wants to connect ideas and themes as we go through this story. He's leading you on this journey out of your old life into new creation life in Christ's name. He's beginning this scene. It's a new scene, but he uses the word therefore to say this is related to what I was just telling you. In the last section, we were told that a week before the Passover was to begin, many Jews began to purify themselves in preparation for the Passover. But we remember that Jesus, he doesn't need to purify himself. He's already the perfect spotless lamb. He is pure and righteous. So he departs to a small village a little north of Jerusalem. But now John again notes, we're at the beginning of the week, six days before So you're thinking about what would be six days after. What's the significance of six days in Scripture? The Passover is about to begin in six days. And John is explaining what Jesus was, how Jesus is preparing himself for the Passover in a different way. Not as a worshiper who needs to be purified by the lamb's blood, but as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb himself. He is beginning a new week of work that by the end of the week will bring rest for all who follow him. Now John's describing the preparation for that work. Jesus returned to the town of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, Bethany, and they're going to throw a meal for him there, a dinner to honor him as a special guest They all valued him so greatly. He is the honored guest at their table, and each of them is going to show honor to him, display the value they see in him as best they can. So John says, first, Martha served. That word served is translated from the word meaning deacon. She deaconed. She took the initiative to organize this meal and see that it went through well. She served. As many people expected, Jesus was the promised coming king. He deserves a royal feast. And Martha is just glad to be in his presence, just be in his royal courts as an ordinary servant. So she gets busy working. You see that eagerness from Martha in a lot of places in scripture, like Luke chapter 10, when she is actually rebuked for working when she should have just sat under his teaching. But this is not a teaching moment, so we don't get that negative sense of her work here. This is a moment of honoring Jesus according to the value they see in him. Martha sees him as a king worthy to be served. And then now Lazarus, John tells us, is reclining at table with Jesus. That's how they ate in that time. Their tables were really low to the ground and they put pillows all around it and you'd sit on the pillow with your feet kind of behind and lean in to one another and eating, just relaxed, enjoying your feast. That's not, again, this is not meant to say that Lazarus was lazy while Martha worked or Martha was an anxious busybody while Lazarus rested in Jesus. The point is simply to emphasize that they were each showing honor to Jesus as a valued guest. Lazarus trusting in Jesus as his king, his protector, his provider. Remember where Lazarus was in the last chapter. Dead in a tomb. (laughs) This is crazy to think about. Lazarus was dead and now Jesus has brought him back to life. So much of the work that we do is just trying to sustain our own lives. I'm trying to get money so I can work and put food on my table and make it to the next day. But in this moment, Lazarus knows that the one who sustains his life is sitting right next to him. He can simply lay back, lean into Jesus, rest in his provision as the king of his life. This valuing Jesus as king to be served and trusted is certainly something we all need to grow in, in our faith. But this is the Passover. So that's not the point he's trying to make. 
John wants us to dig even deeper than this. So in verses 3 through 8, he, he slows down on the moment of Mary expressing how she values Jesus. She doesn't even realize how much she is honoring him as your sacrifice. Look back in those words starting in verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, he said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Again, this section begins with the word, therefore. Mary steps forward to honor Jesus as her king in another unique but different way. They all have the same thing in mind, but John wants us to see deeper. Mary takes this pound, a pound of expensive ointment, a large jar of expensive ointment imported from the Far East and pours it all over him, all the way down to his feet. Verse 5 says this ointment was worth 300 denarii. One Roman silver denarius is worth about a day's wage for an ordinary laborer. So this is a year's salary for an ordinary laborer. Maybe $50,000 in today's money. Spent all in a moment, poured all over Jesus. Mary believes Jesus' value to be worth all that she has, more than 300 denarii, all that she has to live on for that year and into the future. Her life savings. She has nothing else to live on, trusting Jesus to care for her entire life as her king. Mary is honoring her soon-to-be enthroned king by anointing him with oil. Maybe this reminds you of 1 Samuel 16, when Samuel anoints David in the shepherd's field, saying, this is the guy. This kid is going to be the king of Israel. Throughout scripture, anointing someone with oil was a symbol of the water of life combined with the spirit to mark somebody as called by God to prepare and authorize that person for the holy task of connecting heaven and earth again. Jacob anointed a stone that he slept on and he had a dream while he's laying on that stone about a ladder or a stairway to heaven and he wakes up and he calls that place Bethel and he anoints it saying, this is where heaven touched earth. Or you have the priests in the tabernacle anointed, both the tabernacle and the men working in it, anointed with oil, saying the work done in this place is meant to connect earthly men with their heavenly God. And so when Samuel poured oil on David's head to become king of Israel, it was to call him to represent God's heavenly authority over all things right here on earth through his kingship. Most of the time, the oil would be poured on somebody's head. But now John says she pouring it on Jesus' feet. The other accounts of this story in Matthew and Mark do note that she poured it on his head. The amount of oil she had, it was plenty to just drip down and cover him and get his feet as well. John is drawing attention to his feet as a way of showing Mary's humility. She's trying to get as low as she can beneath him. She does not deserve to be in his presence, to stand over him and pour oil on him. No, she needs to get down as low as she can so that his spirit would pour out and drip onto her head. 
So Mary gets low and loosens her hair and wipes her feet with her own hair. Kind of a strange thing. To them, it would have been less strange and much more scandalous. A woman at that time would, hold, would tie her hair up and keep it covered as a symbol that she is under the authority of the head of her household. But for her to do something like this, that's, that's scandalous. It's shocking. We don't do that today. We have different ways of showing submission to authorities. But she just let her hair down. You ever heard that phrase, letting her hair out, letting her hair down? It's a, it's a figure of speech, meaning she doesn't care what anybody else thinks. She's just living free as though there's no care in the world. This is Mary right now. She doesn't care about the judging eyes of others around her. She wants to display that Jesus is her master. She has so much sin in her life. She's openly admitting by pulling her hair down that she, her life is a mess. The only place she deserves to be in his presence is under his feet, ruled by him, begging for mercy. Like Ruth, laying at Boaz's feet, asking him to be her head of provision. And so John notes that the house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. Alluding to all those sacrifices in Exodus and Leviticus, when they offered the sacrifice and burned it up, the smoke would fill the tabernacle as a sweet aroma pleasing to God. This perfume that Mary is using is a physical experience of how pleasing to God her humble sacrifice is. She pleads for mercy through the sacrifice of this great treasure, not even knowing that through it she's preparing Jesus to be her sacrifice. Judas didn't know it either. He was proud, ignorant. He didn't value Jesus as a sacrifice or a king. He's sick of all this playing around. What have we been doing for the last three years? John notes in hindsight that Judas is not genuine in his engagement. It seems like every time the gospel writers write about Judas, like they have this gut reaction, oh, that guy who betrayed the Lord of glory. Judas is growing frustrated that they just keep sleeping on the ground and healing sick people and eating with poor people. I thought we were going to overthrow the Romans and make ourselves the rich and powerful ones. He's tired of these games. So almost as an accusation, he asks why the ointment wasn't sold to get more money to feed the poor people. That's what we've been doing this whole time, isn't it? Just feeding poor people. He didn't care about the poor. The problem is he didn't know who Jesus is and what he came for. To him, Jesus was just a tool to get himself rich. If Jesus wasn't going to do it in the way Judas wanted, he'd find a way to get rich himself. He was the guy in charge of carrying the money bag for the group to help pay their bills, buy food in the market, maybe get them a place to sleep. But every time someone puts some in, take a little out for himself. Judas thinks that this anointing is just a huge waste because he doesn't equate the value of what Mary is giving up with the value of gaining Christ. He's not worth the expense. This is too lavish for this ordinary Jesus. Judas values himself much more highly. That value should be placed on him, or at least a portion of it. Isn't that the way it always seems to go? in this world, right? The, the people who are most vocal about caring for the poor are often the ones who really care most about themselves. The people who are most vocal about all the things the church is doing wrong really care more about how little everyone else is sacrificing for them. Their work is just a pretense of gaining honor for themselves. 
Usually the ones who, the politicians who propose these policies for taking away your money to help those people over there are the worst ones at using their own money to help those people. It's what we call virtue signaling, right? You just want to look like you're helping enrich the lives of others, but you're enriching yourself. Is that you? Is that why you're here, just to look virtuous? That's Judas. He's going to do whatever it takes to get his honor. And shortly, he's going to go value Jesus at 30 pieces of silver in exchange for handing him over to the priests. Martha, Lazarus, Mary, they value him as the king of the world. But Judas was happy to get just a month's paycheck to get rid of him. Mary was willing to sacrifice a great treasure just to have Jesus. Judas would sacrifice Jesus just to get a measly treasure. So he drops Jesus off at Goodwill to get a tax deduction slip valued at $34.99. Not knowing that all this was coming, or Jesus knew all this was coming, and he shifts the focus in verses 7 and 8. It's right. It is right for Mary to honor him as her king. But he says even more. She's preparing him for his death. Jesus doesn't even confront Judas in all of this wickedness. He just lets him go. Because Judas is actually part of his plan. Judas' betrayal is going to help him accomplish his plan to sacrifice himself. What's amazing in his answer is that he affirms Mary and elevates her offering as worth so much more than 300 denarii. It's ironic that Judas is about to hand Jesus over to the priesthood that is corrupt, not acting as true priests. But then Jesus says Mary is actually acting more priest-like in preparing him to save the world, to bring heaven and earth back together again. The grammar of this sentence is kind of tricky to translate. It makes it sound like it's something that she's going to save this oil for the future. Like she's holding on to it for later. But the idea that we're trying to get at here is she's using all of it to mark him as a sacrifice who will die later to cover their sins. She didn't realize it. Jesus explained that's the significance of this moment. He elevates the role of this woman who is keenly aware of his value and capable of honoring him in her unique and powerful priestly way. And then finally, Jesus corrects Judas's value miscalculation, saying, it's, this is worth it. Jesus is worth your time, your money, your effort. He's soon going to be gone after his death, resurrection, ascension to his heavenly throne. Right now, he says, is the time to declare your allegiance. Right now, not after you get all your problems taken care of, not after you get your lives together. Today is the day to honor Christ and trust him with your future. He quotes Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, that the poor will always be with you. He's not, he's not saying that it's okay to be lavish with your money and not care, with the po not care for the poor. Oh, John Calvin just has paragraph after paragraph on this statement, rebuking the Catholic Church when they use these very words to justify stealing money from the poor by selling indulgences, tickets to heaven so they can build their massive cathedrals displaying their own honor. It is not pleasing to God to create these lavish worship experiences at the expense of the poor. Jesus is not expressing this defeated, defeatist attitude that, you know, poverty is going to be a problem forever, so you're never going to be able to solve it, so don't even try. He's saying that God is at work in the lives of the poor, they will always be with you so you have an opportunity to display gospel generosity toward them. 
honoring Jesus in generosity towards others. But we must get first things first. Jesus is shifting their focus to the bigger picture that he's about to die and rise from the dead and take authority over all things. Only in the gospel will the problem of poverty be solved. Love God first, then love your neighbor. Only by Jesus rising to the throne will we finally have the power to overcome poverty of all kinds, both physical and spiritual. And so with that vision of Christ on his heavenly throne, caring for his people, John now moves the scene to the crowds in verses 9 through 11, encouraging us to see him as your coming resurrection. Verse 9, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So chapter 11 ended with a bunch of people coming to Jerusalem to prepare themselves for the Passover. And they've been wondering, is Jesus come? Where's Jesus? I want to see this guy. And now they hear he's in Bethany, just a couple miles to the east. That's easy enough for us to go travel to. Let's walk over there and see him. And they've come to see both Jesus and Lazarus, not to give honor to Lazarus, but to see with their own eyes what they have heard, to come and witness the power of Christ alive in this man. Is Lazarus really alive after being dead for days? If that's true, then this Jesus deserves to be honored, followed, trusted with your whole life. If he can raise people from the dead, he could do anything for you. There's no Roman oppression. There's no corrupt priesthood and threats of death that can keep you down. Jesus is invincible and he's making all of his followers invincible. The crowds knew that the priests wanted them to turn him in. But if he can really raise people from the dead, what's the point? Verse 11 says that Many were going away from the chief priests and the Pharisees' teaching and authority and turning to trust Jesus' teaching and authority. The chief priests kind of provide a foil against these believing Jews, against the ordinary faith of this crowd. The crowd sees something as simple as Jesus having power over death and they trust him. Uh, simple logic. Jesus can raise dead people. I'm following that guy. The chief priests, they just don't see it. What? They dismiss it. They try to hide it. They can't see the value of Christ. And not only can they not see it, they want to steal it from others so nobody else can see it. They don't want anyone to stand as a testimony of his power and authority in their own lives. So in verse 10, they plot to do the exact same thing to Lazarus, to Lazarus, what they planned in chapter 11, verse 53. It's almost the same phrasing. They plan to kill Jesus. What an astounding refusal to see what a treasure Jesus is. To refuse to let their beliefs be changed by undeniable facts. This is insane. It's not rational. They are plotting to kill the man that Jesus just raised from the dead. Like he just can't do it again. This is the blindness of sin. This is why ordinary church life is a threat to the world. Right in front of them is the greatest treasure, the greatest power, the greatest promises. They can't see it. And the crowds of people are proclaiming to them, there is a priceless treasure available right here at Goodwill. In this thrift store of ordinary people, the king of the universe is hanging out with us. But they will not be convinced that something so valuable could be found in such an ordinary cheap place with a yellow sticker that says $34.99 on it. They're sick of people talking about it, so they're going to burn the whole place down. Some people think 
today that they would finally believe God if he did something powerful and miraculous, if he spoke directly to them. Maybe if someone came back from the dead, then they would believe it's been done. All those things have been done. And statements like these show us how hard our natural hearts are. We so hate God in our natural condition that we will make all kinds of excuses to suppress the truth so we do not have to bend the knee before Jesus. He displays his power clearly among his people right before our eyes. And we don't see it. We need God to open our eyes so we can behold the treasure that Christ is. And then when you see him, you will be able to be like Martha and Lazarus and Mary. You'll understand what he accomplished in his sacrificial death, his power over death and his resurrection, his current reign over all things from heaven, his spirit working among us, his authority as your king, and you will respond appropriately. You'll become a servant like Martha. You will joyfully rest in his provision like Lazarus. You will sacrifice greatly of all your treasure like Mary in worship. You'll trust him with your life even when the world dismisses you. Don't wait for him to try to do some trick for you and prove his power. He's already done it. Today is the day of salvation. Surrender whatever it is you're holding on to today to him. Honor Christ as your only source of life. So where do you do that today when you don't have an opportunity to pour out your oil on him? Well, let's think about where you're able to see his power, his beauty, his worthiness on display in our lives. When Luke wrote the book of Acts, the very first verse, he said, when I wrote these other things to you, referring to his previous gospel message, the gospel of Luke, he said, I wrote about the things Jesus began to do and teach, suggesting that as he writes about the church, the growing church, that this is how Jesus continues to work and teach. As Jesus said in verse 8, he's not present bodily anymore with them when he died. He rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He's ruling as king from heaven. But then in Acts chapter 2, he sends his spirit out to work in the same ways among his people, through his church. Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to the church in Matthew 16 and 18. And he tells us to take that authority and spread it throughout the earth in Matthew 28. He said, go with that authority and help the sick, feed the poor, take dominion over creation as a church, as an extension of his work, as members of his body. So therefore, the amount of value you see in Jesus will be reflected in what you give to his church. Martha served Jesus because she saw him as her master. Lazarus reclined and feasted with Jesus because he saw Jesus as his friend and provider. Mary gave generously, sacrificially in worship to honor him as a sacrifice. The crowds followed him despite these threats of death because they trusted him with the power of resurrection. If you see those same things in Christ, then you will honor him accordingly in his body. If you want to put Christ's power, his value on display to the world, you will do it among these people that God has put you with. You'll submit to his authority and find your place of service among the church. You'll rest in his provision, opening your heart up to one another, trusting in his body to come and serve you and care for you in your weakness. You'll give generously, sacrificially of your own treasures, giving up your preferences, your priorities to be in the presence of your sacrifice who gave his life for your sins. You'll trust in his spirit at work in this body to preserve your life until your own resurrection from the dead. If you're not doing these things, ask yourself, what do you value more than Christ? 
Are you like Judas? Come to church following Jesus just to get more for yourself? Using Jesus and his church to get the things you really want? Do you value worldly comforts out there? You'd rather keep those for yourself. You'd rather hold on to those treasures than surrender them to receive the treasure of Christ. Maybe anxiety and shame lead you to try to preserve your own heart. You're closed off to the church to keep your own dignity instead of letting your hair down and surrender. Let go of the value of your own control and give it all to King Jesus. See his magnificent eternal value in his life, death, and resurrection and honor Christ as the only source of life. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would open our eyes so that it would become natural for us to run to him, to serve him, to rest in him, to worship him, to work for him and trust him until the day you pull us from the ground. Would you help us worship now, confident that not even death can hold us down, that the gates of hell will not prevail against us, that your promises are sure, true, yes, and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen.